All right, welcome back to Thursdays with me. Um, I'm Ron. Today is March St. Patrick's Day. So I tried to figure out how to turn the background green, but I'm actually not technically literate enough to do that. So I couldn't do it. All right. Um, but happy St. Patrick's Day if you do that sort of thing. We got some more inequalities for you today. Uh, they were, we got a few left from yesterday, from last time. I really got to go through a couple of those last time. And then some more good stuff for you. So let's, let's do some of those. Again, here's the copyright attribution. Once more, just for the sake of the recording, um, we can use the freeware problems. Anything that's from the free GMAT prep software, we can use. Anything that's from a paid GMAX source, we can't. It's, it's pretty easy to differentiate those. If it ends with PAC, we can't use it. If it doesn't from them, we can. That's pretty much how it works. OK, um, let's do a problem. Let's do one. Let's do it. How about? But this one. This one is actually not from GMAT prep. This one is from ours. By the way, we do assume a certain level of um, we, we assume a certain level of basic literacy at data sufficiency. So we assume that you know the data sufficiency answering choices here. So if you like, we assume you know what A, B, C, D, and E are. That's where you indicate the multiple choice answers to this. This one is from our tests. In fact, I wrote this problem. OK, go for it. Okay, um, so, hmm. very interesting. Well, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I don't normally put the answer distribution on the board, but I'm going to this time because it is interesting. It's interesting for a couple of reasons. Um, it's interesting because, first of all, there's this like massive favorite, which is actually wrong. Like this, this, this is not the right answer. So nope. Even though it's the answer that is by far the favorite of the crowd, but it's not correct. But what, what's more interesting to me is that so many people pick choices B and D, boy and dog. I mean, like, there's a total of, I mean, maybe those are just random guesses, but, like, total, there's a total of seven people who picked these choices where, like, that means that seven people said that that statement two was sufficient. Which is a bit crazy if you think about it. Because statement, statement two just tells you that about C and A, but it doesn't tell you anything about B. You know, I, I mean, so just make sure that you, that you back up a, a step from this for a second. So remember, this is a yes no style of, of problem here. And we'll worry about inequalities here in a bit and what kind of stuff you should be thinking about when you do think about this. But absolutely nobody should have an answer box. What is an answer box? You, you should have the same answer. This is where you pick multiple choice answers. Same place as everybody else does with this graphic that we put on the screen. This is where you pick multiple choice answers. 
underneath you find your name in this thingy, and then underneath your name there's this letter A looking thing, and then you see a pull down menu. So you'll see that on there. Um, okay. So, <clears throat> but yeah, I mean, there should definitely be nobody picking B or D here because, I mean, statement two is pretty clearly not sufficient here, right? Because you just remember what how this works, right? This is this is a yes or no style question. So, a, a yes to this question would mean that. A and B and C are in that order. So it means that A is less than B, which in turn is less than C. And then a no to this question means that anything else So, and so sufficient means that only one of those can happen, and then not sufficient means you can make both of these true. So, it's it's just the same old deal with, with making those happen. So, we've talked about this kind of device in other study hall sessions, so let, let's, just, let's just make this organizational device that we've talked about. So, can you make A less than B less than C, or can you make anything else happen? And then for statement one, for statement two, and possibly for both. And then this is your goals in front of your face, and if you have this organizational device on your work, then it'll help you keep everything straight, what it is that you're trying to do. So the deal is if you check off both of those boxes, basically, in a column, then not sufficient, right? And I mean, there's, this sort of device is something that I introduced in there's a bunch of study hall sessions on yes, no, data efficiency questions. You can check those out if you want. But if you check uh, both the boxes in a column, then not sufficient for that statement or combination of statements. So where this column is for statement one, this column is for statement two, and this column is for both if you get to that point. Okay, can I get to statement two, guys? I mean, if all we know is that A is less than C, then it's definitely possible for B to be in the middle of those. But it's also possible for B to not be in the middle of those. Right? So statement two, not sufficient. Smiley face, if that makes sense. About statement two. So, I mean, again, people picking B boy, D dog, I mean, I, I'm kind of curious as to what the deal was there. But this, this just means that A is less than C, and that's all it means. So, we have total freedom as far as. B goes, which means that both of those things are possible. So we we could we, we could have that, but we also could have that A less than C. We could have other situations too. We could also have B less than A. Or B can be bigger than those, or we can even have equal. We can have, you know, I mean, B, B could equal A, or we could equal C. There's just so many possibilities, right? So there's just loads and loads of things that could happen. So both of these are possible. This is not sufficient, and that should be pretty much an instant disqualifier.
Okay. As far as statement one is concerned, I mean, let's, let's yeah, let's talk about statement one. Yeah, let's let's, let's talk about it. Um, so inequalities are not equations. You probably knew that, right? Of your fact of the day. Fun fact of the day. Inequalities are not equations. I mean, how not? For the two ways in which they aren't. That, so there's, first of all, there's this whole idea of a range of solutions, okay, that thing. Um, that thing about fractions, I don't know, that has to do with inequalities, though. Um, that range of solutions, so therefore, this whole idea of minimum and maximum might matter, okay. in a way that they don't matter in equations, sure. But also, here's the other thing, right? I mean, you probably remember in some sort of junior high math sort of thing, if you were solving an inequality like this, negative 2x plus Three is less than uh, less than or equal to five. Okay. Well, the first step of that would just be normal subtraction, right? And then everything would be normal, and that would just be negative two x is less than or equal to two. But then the next step is not that normal. What what else? Like what happens when you try to do this division step? Oh, hey, so you have to, like, deal with turning signs around in a way that you don't. Because with equations, so, like, the deal with equations is, like, intuitively, it's not that hard to understand why you have to do that step. I mean, you know, like, this is, so this is really, this, this, has, to do, this has to do with this other thing that we're talking about here. Signs matter is basically the point of this. So, <laughs> signs matter. So you have to think about signs. Consider them, at least, in a way more so than with equations. I mean, it's, it's easy enough to understand why, like, this is from an intuitive standpoint. I mean, when you divide, you can just, when you divide by negative 2, you can just think of that intuitively as two steps. You can think of it as cutting something in half and then just reversing a sign. And when you reverse a sign, it should make sense why you would flip inequalities. Like, if something is more than, like, 5, then you can intuitively understand why minus that thing would be less than minus 5. So it makes no sense. But the deal is, like, when you think about stuff like this, you you really have to watch it with, I mean, the minimum and maximum here are not so much going to be issues, but you need to be very careful with signs here. So careful with that. Right. So like with statement one, let's let's test cases for that. I mean, like, the first thing you're probably going to think of for statement one is probably going to be pretty straightforward type of cases where everything is positive. So for statement one, yeah, like let's say A, B, C. So you might you might pick C, B, and A in that order, so that. And then check that 1 over C, 1 over B, 1 over A. And then 
Okay. Okay. So let's make some columns for that. The first thing you might think of here would be something like, I don't know, one, two, three. Because then this would be one third, one half, and one over one. And then this works the way that you want it to. I mean, you have to check this statement to make sure that it works, and it does. And then, indeed, it is true that three, so three, two, one, that's um, one. A is three. I have this backwards, don't I? I do. I have three. Okay, let me just do this. This is this is the other order. Okay, so in this case, this is one, two, and three. So one, two, three. And it is true that one is less than two, which is less than three. So that's going to check off this box. Now here's the deal. Like, what what is our only goal in life at this point? And this is where it helps to make this device on your paper just to remind yourself. But what are we trying to do at this point? Don't say things like prove it wrong because that's not a thing. Trying to find, like, make this as concrete as you can. Trying to, imagine that you are actually trying to make Excel do this. Like, trying to tell Excel what you want it to find. Excel doesn't know what words like wrong and counterexample mean. So you, you see part of the problem here is that people don't know what the goal is in the first place, right? You you want, I mean, you should literally, like, imagine that these are actually columns in Excel and you are actually programming Excel to decide whether things were sufficient or not. Because you, you, could, you could do that. You could actually program Excel to test these cases. And, I mean, Excel doesn't know what wrong means. And Excel doesn't know what not true or counterexample or doesn't work means. I mean, Excel does not know what any of these words mean. So you need goals that Excel understands, right? You want, you want B to not be between A and C is what you want. You want those to not be in that order. Or you want... You want this order to be anything other than this, while still maintaining this order, is the point. So, and one way that we can really do that without too much fuss is to just mess around with sign. I mean, we can just make C negative, or we just keep B and A where they're at. You know, we just keep those at two and one. So one over B and one over A can just stay where they are, and then, then if we just make C something negative, yeah, people are using negative, this is like negative 10, um, then it doesn't, yeah, as long as anything negative, it doesn't really matter, but that's going to throw out an off balance, right? So this works. I mean, neg negative anything is still less than positive anything. So that still satisfies statement one. But now this is absolutely no longer true. So we can check off this box. Well, look at that. So this is not sufficient. You put commas. Oh, okay, I see what you mean. Now this this is just this is a product. So what they're trying to do with this is this is just telling you that none of them are zero. 
Although that is, even if this were, this is actually this is actually the same thing as that. That, that, that doesn't matter. Um, this is the same as. This is the same as a comma b comma c are not equal to zero because that's even if you put commas in there it doesn't matter um, because they could still be negative. So ironically, that doesn't matter. If they told you positive, that'd be a whole world of difference because positive products is a, is very different from telling you that individual numbers are positive. But ironically, that's a mistake that doesn't matter because telling you telling you their product is non-zero is in fact exactly the same thing as telling you that all of the individual numbers are not zero. So. Um, Okay, but notice this is not a stretch. This is not obscure craziness. I mean, if you, the two kinds of things that, that you think of as things when you think of inequalities should be extremes and signs. So if, meaning it's not, it's not nuts that you should think of something like that. You know, it, it's not crazy at all. This should be the first kind of exception that comes to mind. So any questions about individual statements? Okay. Now, here's the deal with this. If you have the statements together, you got to combine these things. If we put them together, If we just consider this, I mean, let, let's let's take our eyes off of B for a second. I mean, if you just think about, consider for a second just C and A. Consider the fact that 1 over C is less than 1 over A and C is greater than A. For a second, this is how numbers behave when they, I mean, if they have different signs, these would be opposite. Uh, all right, can you guys hear me now? What was the last thing that you heard me say? Okay. So you mostly heard everything that's good. Um, <laughs> say, um, you know these things have the same sign, right? Like they, because if, if they had opposite signs, then if if C were negative and A were positive, then one over C and C would both be less than one over A and A. So if you have this kind of behavior, then this means they have to either both be positive or both be negative. So what, what this means is that you can't have this kind of thing anymore. So then if you have these two together, then you've got the same sign. And so then within the same sign, reciprocals, which means, you know, one over the number, Within any particular sign, whether it's positive or negative, reciprocals, which means one over the number, get smaller as numbers get bigger. So what that means is, since we know they're the same sign, so if we know same sign, then 1 over C less than 1 over B less than 1 over A definitely means A less than B less than C. So that's sufficient. Don't they have to tell you what? No, we, we, we figured it out because we, we know it from the two statements together. I mean, we, we know it because we know this and we know this from having that. That's the point. If we have the two statements combined, 
then we can figure that out. We can we can put this information together and we can figure it out. Otherwise, oh, of course, otherwise they're going to tell you that. And that's the point. But I mean, you should be tuned in to thinking about signs because this is an inequality problem, and signs are a huge, big thing on inequality problems. You should you should definitely have that at the forefront of your mind. Um, but the whole point of having these together is that you should think about that. The other thing about statement two also is that they're telling you this, which considering that statement two is part of this, that should make you think about like, uh, why are they doing that? It, it should very strongly make you suspect that this is necessary, you know, because it, it's considering that this is a piece of what's already the goal statement, that should make you look at that as, as very interesting that they would do something like that. You know, it, it's probably not for no reason that they would do that. <clears throat> okay. It, it is a piece of statement one, which, which should make you kind of suspect that it's not stupid that it would just be put there like that. Exactly. I mean, yeah, it, it's probably not totally random. Anyway, <clears throat> all right, any other questions about this problem? Again, that is the biggest takeaway here is that you should really think about signs, especially before you jump to conclusions about stuff like statement one. Signs are a thing, they are very important thing. Okay. Let's do another one. And uh, this one's from Jeanette Pratt. Yeah, it's the like cat. Mm -hmm. This one's from the prep software. Let's do this one. Remember where are those multiple choice answers are found. Go for it. Can you guys see the question? Maybe? Some people can't see the question. Let me try to page back and page forward, see if there's anything. Okay, you should see it now. All right, let's talk about it. We have an almost perfectly bimodal response is here. Look at that. Look at all those C's and E's. We have almost almost perfectly bi bimodal. There's your word of the day. It's like when you have two peaks. There. Bimodal response distribution. Two favorites. Okay. Well, let's discuss this. Talk about it. Do you, do you know what they're doing with this here? Like, is this anything astound, uh, astoundingly deep that you need to pay a ton of attention to? Yeah, no, it's not really. It's it's what Kevin says. Kevin actually nails it perfectly here. They're they're just trying to make sure that the denominator is not zero. So that is exactly what it is. 
I mean, they'll do that. Um, this is important to know because when, when they give you conditions in the problems that are real conditions, you have to make sure that you are absolutely using every single one of them. But in this case, this is really just bookkeeping and this is just being administratively thorough pretty much is what this is. So, but if they give you facts that are real facts, you need to make sure that you are actually using all of them in some sort of way that is genuine. So, okay. Um, can we multiply through by x plus y right now? Can we do that? Heck no, we can't. Nope. Can't do it. Because signs, we don't know the sign of that. Can't do it. We can't multiply both sides by x plus y because we don't know sign of x plus y. That's the deal. So what this means we're going to have to do is we're just going to have to test cases again. I mean, because there's not really an algebraic way to deal with this. So let's just let's just deal with it. Let's just test cases. So let's just pick an x. Let's pick x's. Let's pick y's. And then let's just do that fraction. X minus y, x plus y, and then fraction. And then, I mean, as far as columns goes, I mean, I I am very I'm, I'm I make a lot of mistakes with with stuff like this, so it's better for me to just make all of these columns and then not have to worry about it one way or the other. So, like, I would make all of those columns of x minus y and x plus y just, just, just easier that way. Smaller chance of a mistake. So there you go. Okay. Um, so let's do the same part. There, x minus y over. Okay. There's some columns. All right, let's let's do some stuff. So remember when you do testing cases like this, a couple of notes about testing cases. The first thing about it is that the first case that you test can be totally random. And because, remember, you're trying to make two different things happen. So the first case is going to make one of those things happen regardless. So you don't need to think too hard about that. And then the second thing is just make sure that you just organize. And I mean, even if you don't have the column set up in advance, just set up columns. When you first run a case through the situation, just set up columns according to the steps that you naturally do anyway. So, meaning if you don't, if, you, if you're not, if you're not naturally, if you don't naturally tend to set these kinds of columns up well anyway, then what you can do is just the first time you run a case through the process, just observe what it is that you're doing and then just make columns for it. You know, like just imagine that you had to do Excel or something. Like imagine you had to make an Excel sheet and then just make one. It's, it's like having to document anything else. So, Okay, and then this is a yes no question, so we can document it. We should make that device accordingly. So let's do that. So we have make 
that whole thing, um, make that thing greater than one, and then make that thing not greater than one. And then that is, that's the thing we're trying to make, greater than one or not greater than one. Okay. There's a device. We want to set that up for statement one, statement two, and very possibly both of the statements. Okay. And remember that, remember that you can set this device up before you even look at the rest of the question. You can set this up just based on the um, just based on the question part of this. You don't need the rest of it. You don't need the statements or the rest of the condition. Okay, so let's do it. Someone give me random x and y. Well, it's, I don't know, like one and two. That were, I mean, one minus two is negative one. One plus two is three. One negative one divided by three is minus one third. I mean that is definitely less than one because it's negative. So that's going to check off this box. And at this point, our goal in life is to check off that box. I mean, how can I do that? Yeah, if you look at this, because if you want this to be greater than one, then that that's like you want this to be bigger than that, which means if I want subtracting something to give me more than adding it, then taking a negative value for y is a good way to do that. So, and so Lin uses two and negative one. Let's use those numbers. So. That's 2 minus negative 1 is 3, 2 plus negative 1 is 1, so that would be positive 3. 3 is more than 1. That's not sufficient. Okay. Um, statement 2 says that y is negative. Th these were for statement 1. Notice we can we can import this into statement two because y is negative. And it also works for both statements if we get there. So we can check off that same box for statement two. But we need to check off this box. So we need we need y negative, and we need to try to make this. How do you make? Let's see. What does this say? How do you make a row two in the chart? Row two in the chart. What is row two in the chart? Uh, because it's so this is th that's just the basics of how data efficiency works. Like this, this is a question whose answer is yes or no. Um, this is the the original yes no question. The, 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 this is this is a yes to the original question. The top row of this and. This is a no to the original question. But the, the point is, I mean, this has been the topic of 
lots and lots of this has been a topic of, of innumerably many of these sessions, but the, the reason why people find so many of these things hard is that they think in terms of yeses and nos instead of thinking in terms of like numbers and greater and less and stuff like that. Because the words yes and no are not goals. And they're not they're not things that numbers do. They're not they're not you, you can't pick numbers that say no. And that's that's the, that's where all the difficulty comes from is that people have goals that are not goals. You know, it's it's the same thing as when people it's like when people say I'm going to eat healthy instead of saying I'm going to cut like 50% of my carbs and 10% of my calories, right? It, um, I think I did check the wrong box. Yes, thank you. Um, it, it's, you have goals that are not goals, and so you can't tell if you've met them or not, right? That's the, the problem. So you want to define goals that are actually concrete. Um, as far as the mic, I kind of am doing the best that I can do with my with my setup that I've got here. So, Laura, um, if it's if I, I apologize if there is if the sound is tough, um, I'm doing the best I can. All right. Um, Okay, we need to check off this box. We wanted to try to be less than or equal to one. How can we do that? Well, let's just try to switch the magnitude of the numbers. So if we try one and negative two, then that would be x minus y would be 1 minus negative 2 is 3, and 1 plus negative 2 is negative 3 and negative 1. And so then that is a negative number, which is most certainly less than 1. So still not sufficient. And in fact, it looks like this works for both statements as well. So without even having to do extra work, we have accidentally proved that it's E because we can just take both of these and import them. So it's still not sufficient. And so this is E elephant. There you go. All right. Um, the other thing with these, especially when the answer is E, but kind of in general, that this is kind of very deeply unsatisfying on an intellectual level. I mean, it's not it's not pretty. It, it's not like high school algebra questions where this big mess of stuff collapses into a neat little thing where everybody cancels out and you just have like a pretty little number at the end. Like nothing cancels anything here and it's just nothing happens at all really. <laughs> no, it's just nothing that happens. What happens on a lot of these, it's just how it works. But, yep, there you go. But a lot of these things, the point is as much what you cannot do as it is what you can do. So, any questions about this? Problem. And I mean, notice again that the point with these things, I mean, I don't think anybody here really has to learn math. I mean, you, there's no math to learn here. Like, what you have to learn is, first of all, maybe just making associations. Like, in this previous problem, you had to learn to see this and think about signs. Maybe being a little bit more organized with your setups and frameworks and stuff, like making devices like this one to organize your thoughts and framework and stuff, and the same sort of device here. Um, understanding that having goals that are actually goals, like not thinking yes and no, but thinking in terms of actual things that are things, like needs. I mean, you know, I, too many people would, would get this problem wrong and think 
but they had to go study inequalities, which would be exactly pretty much the one thing that you don't have to go study if you get this problem incorrect. So just saying, just make sure that you review these with an honest eye to what it is that you actually are having trouble with if you get it wrong, because it's probably not anything to do with inequalities or anything like that. It's probably everything else involved in the problem. Okay, a couple of people are typing. Let me see what it is that you are typing. Um, okay. How do you choose numbers? Well, there's examples on the board here. I mean, you you just kind of do what we did here. I mean, these, these are not these these are not crazy choices of numbers. You know, these are these are perfectly ordinary numbers. You know, if Honestly, x positive, y negative, and they're not allowed to be opposites of each other. These are probably the first two cases that I would think to try would be 2 and negative 1, 1 and negative 2. I mean, those are, those are probably, <laughs> those are, I mean, all honesty with you, those are probably the first two pairs I would throw in there. So, but I mean, Remember the the name of the game here is do stuff and don't not do stuff. I mean, you should just throw numbers in there and see what they do. You know, but they're not they're not going to give you a problem where you have to think of crazy obscure numbers out of nowhere. You know, like they're not going to give you a they will never give you a problem where you have to think of some stupid obscure number and just get lucky. You know, I mean, if if you need strange numbers, there will be clues that, that, that lead you on a very clear path to those numbers. And if not, it will be a problem like this one where, you know, the first couple of numbers that a reasonable person would guess will actually solve the problem, you know, like they do here. I mean, you're just going to do stuff and not, not do stuff. That's what you have to do. So, yep, there it is. Uh, well, two minutes is the average time, so obviously you do not have to solve every problem in under the average time. I mean, averages are averages, guys. There will be just as many problems over the average time, but there will be under the average time. Okay, let's do another one. All right. And by the way, if anybody here is still thinking this weirdness about uh, I have to solve every problem in under two minutes, I mean, that's such a weird thing to think. I don't know where you would get that idea from, but please stop thinking that. Please. For the love of, for the love of everything that's good in this world. Okay. Um, Let's do this one. Alrighty, let's let's pick something pretty soon. There's a lot of non responders to this. There you go, you gotta pick something, guys. <laughs> we've got we got again, okay, we've got another Bimodal distribution. So 
the word of the day today. Dying mode all. Bad. So don't feel bad about guessing stuff, I guess. All right. Anyways, let's talk about it. Um, And notice, like when when you when when you play around with these things, you'll notice that you can rearrange them sometimes, and that sometimes rearranging stuff will yield benefits, and sometimes it won't. Because, like, what you should do, we'll come back to the problem in a second, but when you, as part of your review among the many other things you should do when you review these problems, you should consider the ways in which equations and inequalities can be rearranged and reinterpreted. So for example, and let's say that you had this, let's say you had these two kinds of so say you had this. Well, let's say you had this. You'll, you'll make some discoveries that'll surprise you. You could rearrange this to. You could rearrange this to. You could subtract y from both sides. So you can rearrange it to that. And then this one, similarly, you theoretically could rearrange to just x is greater than y. OK. Now, I, 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 don't, I don't think you would argue with me too much about this if I said that this is more intuitive and more useful than the other version, right? Like this is, I mean, the meaning of this is obvious. Like smiley face, if you would, if you would buy that. Like this is, this is less useful to think about. That doesn't mean anything intuitively to me when I see x minus y is positive. I mean, that's just not intuitive to me at all. On the other hand, you see, the thing is you should avoid coming to some sort of super generalized conclusion because you'll probably find that this is more intuitive than the other version of it. This is more intuitive and more useful than that is. Because like when you see adding two numbers to get positive, this should at least tell you something, right? Like this should tell you that, okay, I mean, that if I have a positive plus a negative, then the positive outweighs the negative. Like this, you, this could be something like positive big and negative small, or it could be two positives, or it could be positive and zero. Right. But here it's just like, what the heck? I mean, I don't even know what that means. Like, think about, especially especially if y itself is negative, think about how not intuitive that is. Like, this just means nothing at all from an intuitive standpoint. In fact, if you, if you were given this, if you had any, no, if you wanted to intuit this, the first thing you would do is transform it into that, is what you would do. With it. So, with these, okay, so you would definitely not want to do anything with this because you, you, you wouldn't like m greater than negative z. There's just that, that's, that's not, that's not anything that's fine. On the other hand, these other two statements, I mean, we can maybe do something with those, right? Like, what, what about statement one? And also, we can rephrase that as how. This, which other 
The <laughs> and height, yay. Um, and as, as far as these, um, I, I really don't understand why this is a default, but um, to me, this seems like the kind of thing that should be turned off by default. But if you if you want that to not happen, here's where you find it. You go to um, you go in tools and you go to chat and you just turn off those emoticons. I mean, I don't. I have no idea why this is turned on as a default. This this makes no sense to me. It seems it seems like the kind of thing that should be turned off by default. But uh, yeah, I, I didn't write the program. So okay, you can make it into M is greater than. Although it is, I don't know why everybody is saying M is less than three Z, which would be M is greater than three Z. Why is everybody saying that? Um, you just add three C to both sides. You yeah, can you can rewrite as M is greater than three Z. I mean, we can use either of those. The thing is that we can we can use both of those as we see fit. I mean, we could use one of them and then go back to using the other one if we want to. And then if we want to, we can also use this as, we can also rewrite this one as 4z is greater than n. So, sure. Okay. All right. So as far as the individual statements are concerned, Remember, let's make goals for this. I mean, yes and no to the original question. And yes, the original question is to make that greater than zero. So make m plus z greater than zero. That's a yes to the original question. And no to the original question is to make it not greater than zero. This is what you should do with yes, no style data sufficiencies in general. You should just make this device. Just keep in mind what is it we're doing here, right? This is a yes to the original question. This is a no to the original question. And for statement one, statement two, and possibly both. In brackets, okay. It's, it's good to get in the habit of setting this up, just because if nothing else, it'll help you get your feet off the ground here. But also, the other advantage of this device is that it's, it's a step. I mean, that sounds kind of dumb, but it is a thing. And like a lot of the time, people's difficulty here is I don't know how to start these problems. And this, this immediately takes care of I don't know how to start the problem because it's, it's a way to start the problem. It's, it's, a, it's a first step. So it's, if your problem is I don't know how to begin, then now you know how to begin. You just draw this device and you start from there. So, OK. Well, see, so statement one. If you think of it as, as m is greater than 3z, then do we know anything about the signs of m and z? We don't, right? Now think about these. Right? I mean, we don't know, like, these could be they could be positive. It could also be negative. 
among others. I mean, you couldn't even have MB positive and GB negative, too. But the deal is they, they could be positives, which means you can check off this box. And they could be negatives, which means you can check off this box. So there you go. You don't even have to pick the specific numbers because you know that if you added two negatives, they would work out this way. And if you added two positives, they would work out that way. And same same deal if you in statement two, you could have positives, you could also have negatives. Exactly the same thing. So statement two is going to look out the same way. Because that's just for Z is greater than M. Same reasoning as statement one. And notice there's no there's no point in wasting the time to come up with specific values if you do this. I mean, efficiency is the name of the game here. Like, if you know that you could clearly have positive values and you could clearly have negative values, then you don't need to actually spend the time to generate the value. Okay. What about putting the together. There's a bunch of ways that you could do this. Okay. One way you could do it is to put them together, is to add them. So, I mean, if you, if you can, I mean, any sort of algebra that is legitimate algebra, of course, you can do. So, um, now remember the name of the game is do stuff and don't and then don't not do stuff. So let's try to do that. So let's um, combine. Let's try adding them. So let's try adding them together. When you get that, when you add those, I mean, you certainly can add inequalities. Yes, you can. So the M minus M, those uh, positive M and negative M go away. And then negative 3Z and positive 4Z gives you Z. And then that's that's greater than zero. Okay, so you know that z is greater than zero. And then and then what? So, you know, people do this sometimes. It's kind of an interesting thing that people do. Um, let me try to make an analogy for what you're doing there. What you're doing there is kind of like you have a million dollars and your friend has a million and five dollars. Therefore, your friend has five dollars more than you. Oh, oh, that's only five dollars more. That means you don't know if you can afford a, a dinner. You see the problem, right? The problem is I told you that you have a million dollars. You forgot that. Like the, the the problem is that you still know all of the things that you knew before. 
Right? You don't you don't just know this. Like you you still also know all of the things that you that you assembled to get there. Like you still know everything that you know on top of that. So you you know this and you also know this. And you also know this. Should those should those come in handy, right? I mean, you, you know, you know all of those things because they're all convenient. Say. I mean, you, you don't you don't for, these don't stop being true. So now we know all three of these things. So we know that z is a positive number from what you proved. But we know, so this this last one doesn't help us, but we know that this one, we know that M is positive as well because it's bigger than Z. So Z is positive, therefore M is also positive because it's bigger than 3Z. So there you go. So both M and Z are positive. So what that means is that that check off that box and the other box is impossible to check off. So this is sufficient. Two things together are sufficient. See, like cat. Do that thing. So this is perfectly valid reasoning. The thing is that you just don't, I mean, you, you just have to remember that you don't forget the information. Like whatever you knew to get somewhere, you still know it, right? So if you, I mean, same thing, right? Like if you, if you, if you have $50 and your friend has $30, if you add those together to get 80, you can't start, you can't start picking random numbers to add to 80. Like you, you still have 50 and your friend still has 30. You can't suddenly make you have 40 and your friend have 40. And you can't suddenly make you have 20 and your friend have 60. It's kind of like that. Like if you, if you have information, you don't suddenly not have that information. It's, you just have to remember what you knew and what you didn't know. So that's all. Um, so your reasoning is perfectly valid. You just forgot that you had more information than you this time again. So this is, this is one way of doing it. You can do that. Um, Smiley faces were good there, especially the person who originally asked about this. Okay, if you are GMAT madness person, especially smiley faces, that makes sense. Kind of, but what doesn't? What what doesn't what doesn't make sense about that? Well, that if it if there's anything unclear about that, it might just be maybe maybe you're new to the whole data sufficiency thing, and you just need to get more used to it, perhaps or something. Um, I, I don't know what you. I, I don't know what you are asking, which kind of comes on the same issue as before of like when people talk about and when people talk about prove it wrong or I don't know or some of your goals that are not goals that are not clear or whatever. But I mean if you if you have all if you know Z is positive and you know this, then you know that you have two positive numbers, which should which definitely proves that M plus Z is positive. So the logic there is pretty bright line. So then, the means that this has a positive, right? Mm. 
Yeah, it was something that's greater than something, something that's greater than something else that you can definitely add. There. Yeah, I mean, when you if you had two facing the opposite way, then you couldn't add those. But that's kind of common sense. So you, you don't have to memorize rules for that. Like if I, you know, if I cost something that if I buy something that costs more than ten dollars, I buy something else that costs more than twenty dollars. Then okay, like something costs more than ten dollars, and something else costs more than twenty dollars. Okay, like together, those really do cost more than thirty dollars. I mean, that's pretty clearly true. And I see thing with less than and less than. If it's less than ten bucks and less than twenty bucks, okay, it's obviously less than thirty bucks. I mean. If it's, if it's greater and less, then you can't add those because then it would matter you know, how much greater, how much less, right? I mean, but there's no need to memorize rules for any of that because you can just think about it in the real world. I mean, you, you, you know, but with two greater than, you can definitely add them together. You're right. Um, although you should think about that when you review the problem as well. I mean, another way that you can do this, though, is you can just think about these two in this form, you can also think about them this way. You can, um, if you have these together, you can put them into one. You can, if we know these together, then we know that, we know that we're used to seeing less than, more than, greater than. So we know that 3z is less than m, and we know that m is less than 4z. So we can write this as this. We can write it as that. We can write it as 3z less than n, which is less than 4z. So think about what do we know here? Like when when does this happen? Like when when does that happen? Yeah, it only happens when z is positive, right? Uh, because if z is zero or negative, this won't happen. So this actually proves that z is a positive number. And then since M is sandwiched between two positive quantities, that would prove M is positive as well. So so because three Z and four Z are clearly positive. So yeah, right. Thus M and Z are both positive. So you can do it that way too. We just do that. And then last but not least, so over time here, but I'll just show you something neat and cool. I mean, you would definitely not ever have to do this, but it's kind of cool. Um, this is like fun extra credit. If you multiply this by five, you get five M. Minus fifteen g squared from zero. If you multiply this by four, you get sixteen g minus four m is greater than zero. Oh, hey, if we add these, look what happens. That's kind of cool. Minus 16z and 16z, and then 5m minus 4m is m. Wow. That's pretty neat. I mean, obviously, you would never have to come up with something like that, but that's just kind of cool. Um, okay, uh, if it's a general question that I can answer in literally like 10 seconds, then you can try, but because we're already like way, way over time here, but otherwise, 
you want to wrap up the curtains here, but let's, let's, uh, let's see what the question is. You can try to turn it at me. Um, okay, well, that's it for today. Thank you, Dr. Music, Mike Black. Um, all right. Let me make sure the board's here. I don't actually. Okay, that is definitely not a thing I can answer in 10 seconds. <laughs> if there was a short answer to that, it would be very rich. Okay, um, thank you guys. We are way, way, way over time. I got to run. Um, let's, let's kill it for now. Um, I'll see you guys in a couple of weeks. I think it might be a different time. Might be a couple hours later next week. Might not. Depends. Go ahead and check the check the web page and see what it says just to confirm that. Otherwise, thank you. See you in a couple of weeks.